Yo, Rants and Reviews back with more audiobooks to listen to. Personally, I enjoy reading more than audiobooks, but sometimes audiobooks are great for when you have something going on that isn't requiring your full attention. You want to listen to something in the background. Maybe you're folding laundry for four and a half hours. Maybe you're organizing all of your empty shoeboxes by shape and color and size. Who knows what it is that you're into doing with your downtime, but sometimes having a nice audiobook in the background can feel like killing two birds with one stone. That's a violent metaphor. Okay, so I've got six more audiobooks. Many of them can be found on YouTube for free. Some of them I found in other ways. First one is The Fall of Gondor by the Tolkien family. I gave this one a six out of 10. Lord of the Rings is my favorite book, series, whatever. It's not really close. I've read them three times. They're very important to me. I remember trying to read The Cimmerillion afterwards and failed miserably. It was too dense and incoherent for my teenage brain. Now that I have an old man's brain, I decided to give the extended universe another shot. Yeah. There are some bits and pieces in here that are fascinating, but that's what it feels like to me. Bits and pieces. There are a few really interesting threads in here in draft prose, but there's also a lot of notes. I guess I'm not hardcore enough to really enjoy the notes. The evolution of and comparisons of his drafts, characters, world, is all just mildly interesting to me. Apparently, this is the third book in a mini-series focused on the Middle Earth universe, and I didn't read the previous two, so that might have affected the enjoyability a bit, but I doubt it's that important. I would only recommend this to hardcore token enthusiasts. Next up is Mort by Terry Pratchett. I gave this one a 7 out of 10. I'm sad that I didn't like this more. Pratchett is compared sometimes to Vonnegut, who is arguably my favorite writer. He's supposed to be quite humorous, but this book, the humor just didn't work for me the way I thought it would. I've been told that Mort might not have been the best place to start with Pratchett, and I didn't dislike it so strongly that I've written him off. So while this book didn't do much for me, I think I will revisit Pratchett in the future. Next, The Theory of Everything by Stephen Hawking. I gave this one a 6 out of 10. Sometimes I read or listen to books like this just to try to be less dumb. You know, I can only learn so much about dragons and spaceships, and sometimes I want to learn about real science. Ever since I did a book report on Stephen Hawking in the sixth grade, which I got an A on, by the way, I've been interested in him and his theories, but I'm also the guy that failed out of my physics class in high school. So while I appreciate him, I don't really understand most of what he's on about. The first part of this book, which covered topics I have some familiarity with, was very interesting. The theories about how the universe started and all the scientists and famous historical figures that contributed to these discoveries. Even the chapters about black holes were relatively easy to follow and understand. But later in the book, when he started talking about thermodynamics and string theory, I just... <sighs> I do appreciate Hawking trying to make this sort of information more accessible for people like me who peaked with earth science and multiplication tables, but it was still a bit dense towards the end. Next was The Great Siege, Malta, 1565, by Ernley Bradford, Ernley, Ernla, Ernl. I don't really know how to say his name. I gave this book an 8 out of 10. Before reading, I knew that Malta was a place that existed and that it was near Italy. That was the extent of my knowledge before listening to this audiobook. I found it to be educational and interesting. 
Apparently, this was one of the bloodiest religious battles in history, with upwards of 30,000 infidels, <clears throat> men, losing their lives. Many history books have the reputation of being dry, and if you're not interested in history, a bit of a slog to get through. But here, Bradford really excels at keeping a brisk pace, describing the action and historical figures involved. It's an impressive blend of depth and brevity, and it leaves you feeling like you've learned a lot quickly. For example, I learned religious people are crazy. Oh, wait, I already knew that. This book does seem to be a bit biased against the Turkish Muslims, but if you can read between the lines, it isn't so bad. Basically, the Ottomans were crazy religious people, death to infidels and all that. And the Knights of St. John inhabiting Malta were crazy religious people, death to infidels and all that. The action scenes are fascinating and brutal and make you wonder why this hasn't been made into a movie. Seems like it could be a great movie. The characters are interesting products of their time, from the devout and ruthlessly efficient Grand Master de Valet to the infamously powerful Suleiman the Magnificent and his feared sailor and general Turgut Reis. I'm saying all these names wrong, aren't I? Bradford really makes you feel like you're witnessing a story populated with legends because it is a story populated with legends. I think the only downside for me was that Bradford painted the Christian knights as the good guys. I would have enjoyed a more neutral retelling, but other than that, this book was fantastic. Next is, oh my God, it's a big one. The House of Sons by Alistair Reynolds. I gave it a seven out of 10, and I feel like it's a crime to say that because this is a very, very highly regarded book in the science fiction genre. Whew, I got a lot to say about this one, so I'll try to pace myself. My first vibe was a little Pornhub sleeping with your step clone thing going on here, which was, uh, yeah, a little interesting. All right. I think I can officially say after this book that even though I love science fiction, hard science fiction might not be for me. I don't think I helped my case by listening to this on audiobook as that always hampers my comprehension a bit, but it's the only format I could even find this book in. This book is epic in scale, jumping all over the universe and through millennia of time. It centers around Campion and Purslane, two members of a family of a thousand clones called Shatterlings that were broken off of the human Abigail Gentian. As members of their line get ambushed and nearly destroyed, it's up to these two to figure out what's going on. Oh, and they have a used-to-be human, then immortal spirit, now robot thingy with them as well. So don't forget that. Oh, and there's flashbacks where Abigail plays medieval sims with some strange boy. So don't forget that. Oh, and there's machine people. Oh, and everyone loves fast spaceships like Fast and the Furious with spaceships. Oh, and these clones have been alive for six million years, but can easily die from falling off a balcony. Even though I'm distancing myself hard from hard sci-fi after lukewarm experiences with Peter F. Hamilton and Ian M. Banks, and now this book, I still have a soft spot for Reynolds. I like his writing. I love some of his short stories, but this one was a bit too demanding for me. Keep in mind, like I said earlier, I failed physics in high school and got a C in both chemistry and biology. I'm not great at science, and some of the talk in this book is pretty intense. I think Reynolds is like an astrophysicist or something. He's something. He is something to do with science that gives him, you know, the ability to confuse me regularly. I still felt a certain respect for how creative and massive the world he's created here is. And so I did enjoy it. I just felt a lot of it was up here. I started the book very confused and very intrigued. As the book got closer towards the finish line, I remained confused, but less intrigued. I thought it was cool that there's no aliens, 
massive universe populated with only humans and post humans and machines and machine humans. But I didn't find any of the characters that compelling. And I wasn't sure whether I wanted them to succeed or fail or what that even meant. When the book finished, I still wasn't quite sure exactly what happened. Also, my biggest issue with the book is a weird one. Campion and Purslane love each other. It's incest. It's fine, whatever. They're clones, they're space people, Game of Thrones. It's cool, I guess. But <laughs> this is going to make me look really bad. I just can't fathom how two people could love each other for millions of years. Totally insane. Most humans can't make it 10 years and these two are chasing each other around the galaxy for millions of years, never got tired of each other, never, millions of years, really? I actually found this more fantastical than any of the science fiction elements. And there it is. Next book was The Black Company by Glenn Cook. This was character-driven, grim fantasy. It was a book, actually, I had been trying to get my hands on for a long time. Another one I was not able to find. That's often the case with these audiobooks. It's either because I found them easily on YouTube, or I just had to find them in an alternate way than their book form, which I was not able to locate. That was the case with The Black Company. I really, really wanted to read this one. Eh, six out of ten. In one way, the characters are all cool and unique. In another, they are annoyingly cliche and repetitive. Yes, we know that silent is silent. My God, he's silent. If I have to hear about him being silent one more time, I'll ask him to record the next audiobook. The captain is a mystery. The raven is cold. Goblin squeaks. We get it. Everyone has to have a silly nickname. Spoonface, Mars Bars, Whiskers, Grape Toes, Vegemite. Feels really overused. You won't find any Freds here. I mean, the captain doesn't even get a name. He's just the captain. Maybe this year I'll tell my students to just call me the teacher. I do appreciate a book that does an info dump. But this is the opposite end of the spectrum. Nothing is explained ever. The Black Company is fighting in a war that is never really explained against an entity that, you guessed it, is never really explained for an entity that's, you guessed it, never really explained. I wanted to like this more, but the writing is very repetitive. And honestly, it's quite bad. No one can ever just say something. Instead, they groan and grunt and groan and shudder. Are they having sex with spiders? And let's not even talk about all these hardened criminals with their giggle addiction. I'm pretty sure Croker is feeding everyone laughing gas, or rather, giggle gas. How can you be a hardened criminal and just giggle all the time? Hee 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 hee. With all those negatives I've listed, though, I'm still relatively intrigued and hopeful that maybe the writing will get better. I feel like my voice has been up here for a lot of this interview. So I guess I'll be treating the Black Company like a shaky reliever. I'll probably trot out the next book eventually, but it will be on a very short hook. So thank you, everybody, for joining me on this latest adventure through audiobooks. Um, yeah, that's it for audiobooks for a while. I probably won't rip off another big chunk until the upcoming summer break. So back to hard copy books for now. And see you next time on Ransom Reviews.